Okay. Um, we have Christina today here with us, and she's going to tell us uh, where in the world she lives and uh, her story with CDH, what her family has gone through. Okay, Christina? Okay. Um, we are located in Hanover, Pennsylvania, South Central PA, here in the U.S. Uh, back on August 17th, 2011, we went in for delivery of our son. Uh, everything seemed pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, as my husband cut his umbilical cord, he I seriously thought there was something wrong with me because I'm holding our son in my arms. And I'm thinking, he's looking funny. And then I'm looking around the room thinking, everything's funny. And then I was like, no, he, there's something really wrong with him. I'm still trying to decide. At that, my husband cut through the cord, and he instantly went blue. No idea what was going on. He was taken to the other side of the room. Um, you know something is really not right when your midwife pats you on the leg and says, hey, you know what? You're doing great. I'm going over with the baby. So uh, a lot of really crazy things started happening at that point in time. Um, he, of course, because of him being blue, he wasn't getting any air. Uh, he tried to code um, because of the lack of air. They were able to sustain him, revive him, get oxygen going. Um, his color started to return. They stabilized him and removed him from the room. Our hospital, unfortunately, does not have a NICU, so... The nurse, our maternity nurse, was actually in charge up until a respiratory therapist could come, and she was manually pumping oxygen into him. Um, I was left in the other room, so I really didn't have a clear idea of what was going on. It felt like it was an eternity sitting in there, and finally... Um, Ironically, my aunt, who is a maternity nurse there, I am the first relative she's ever attended a birth for, and I am going to be the last. Um, she came, got my husband, took him to the other room, and said they'll be back for me as soon as they can. Um, again, it felt like another eternity. It was probably about 15, 20 minutes. Um, they came, got me, took me to the other room where he was, and they explained that he was going to be shipped. We had a uh, air ambulance coming from a nearby hospital that was about 30 minutes away. They showed up, and the doctor um, evaluated and tried to explain what was going on where he deduced from the very fuzzy x-rays that it could be CDH, which we knew nothing about, or cysts developed in his lungs, but the pictures weren't clear. Either way, he said both would require surgery and he would be airlifted. At that time, um, as I said, they came from the nearby one, which is 30 minutes away. In talking with the surgeon, they decided that he should go to the other, the, the Children's Hospital of Hershey, which is about an hour away from us. Um, so we got to process all of this, still not knowing what was wrong with him. Um, he went, the uh, first helicopter left, to which Lifeline came from the Hershey Children's Hospital and the crew came in and they were just exceptionally wonderful in letting us know what's going on and um, seeing him in the isolate for shipping. It was just so surreal. Um, that and the fact that the doctor who flew, her name was Christina. So when they're asking all kinds of information and everything, they're like, okay, what's his heart rate, Christina? And I'm thinking, why are they asking me since my name's Christina? But I knew it because they had already informed me of everything. So I'm like giving the information. And finally, they asked a more, I don't remember the specific question about CDH. And my response was, wait, what's that? When the, everybody just froze, looked at me and realized 
I had been the one giving all the answers so far. And they said, okay, from here on out, your mom, and she's Dr. Christina. So that was kind of heart-wrenching, I guess, because I just suddenly felt not in control. So um, they had noticed with the way his stomach was concaved and everything, it just seemed like he wasn't getting support. So they had pulled out the blanket and put under him so that my husband had a chance to hold him because at that point we didn't know what was going to happen when he left us. And they left me hold him. I got to hold him for like maybe five minutes and they said they had to go. So um, we didn't get a chance to call anybody and let them know what was happening except for we got one call out to my mom who met them in the hallway on the way to the helicopter. And, uh, then he was, they flew him to the next hospital, which was, as I said, an hour away. My husband and I were left without him. And all I kept thinking was, what am I going to tell the kids when we go home? Sorry. No, it's fine. Because he has five older siblings. And... Um, my widow had come back and she's like, you know, you're doing great. This is your sixth baby. She goes, you know how to take care of you. So I'm going to go ahead and discharge you. And I was like, okay. But she made us promise that we would go straight home. I would sleep as much as I could. And she didn't want us showing up at the other hospital until 6 a.m. Because she wanted me to rest. So I was like, okay. So... Um, at seven o'clock, we got a phone call and it was the pilot from Lifeline. And he said, Hey, I just want to let you know that we landed safe. We had a great flight. He didn't have any problems and he's using his name as much as he can. And he's saying, Eric's doing great. Eric was, he transferred, he's stable. You have a very strong baby. I was like, thank you so much. So, um, when they leave with your baby, they give you this intensely filled folder. It's like this thick. <laughs> and I'm looking at it. My husband's looking at it. And we're like, we don't know what's going on. How do they expect me to read through any of this? But um, our pilot had mentioned, he said, if you have any questions, call the NICU. And I was just like, is it too soon to call? I know he just called, but is it too soon? So I called and I got the NICU and I told him who I was. And they're like, we'll put you right through to his nurse. I'm like, great. And it was wonderful because they said, if we can call anytime, 24 seven, they will always talk to us, give us updates, whatever, if we can't be there in person. Um, so we went home, we got tons of hugs from the nursing staff. At our local hospital. Um, my aunt had even stayed an hour past her shift um, just to be with us. There really wasn't talking. Uh, my mom stayed with us there and then as I said I was discharged. I went home. My husband left me there at the house with the other five kids and he explained to them that we don't know what's going on with your baby brother. He's gonna have to have surgery and he's at Hershey right now. He told my oldest daughter, he's like, hey, I have to go to work. I have to fill out some papers because I don't know how long I'm gonna be off with you guys. But I need you to do what you can to make mom comfortable and have her sleep. Um, she was 11 at the time. And having an 11 year old tell me, hey, you need to sleep. You can't get up. You can't walk around. It's just crazy. So I laid on the bed and she just kind of laid with me, holding my hand, looking at me. And she goes, I don't know really what's going on, but it'll be okay. Uh, for some reason, that reassurance helped. The next morning came really fast. It was about 4 a.m. We got up, got ready. And we took our hour drive, just kind of not really talking very much on the way over there. We arrived at the hospital, walked up to the uh, desk there, and I said, I'm looking for the NICU. I said, my baby was brought in last night, to which uh, we walked um, 
we later found out, from the front doors all the way to the NICU to his bed was actually a half a mile. <laughs> and I walked the whole way. Uh, when we got there to the NICU, we had to be buzzed in and you, you know, I take you into this little cubicle and you have to wash up like the doctors before surgery, you know. And you go into the NICU and you see all of these little beds and all of these babies and you're thinking, which one's mine? And then they have, they turn and they go, your son's not here. <laughs> He's over this way. And you find out that your son is so sick that in the NICU, he has his own special room and he has one-on-one -on -one care. And they take us in and there's just like this wall filled with machines and screens and blinking and beeping and sounds and it's just overwhelming and uh, they bring us this laptop and she said okay she said um, this is what's going on she's like your son was born with a congenital congenital diaphragmatic hernia with um, pulmonary hypoplasia and uh, we're just like okay what's that <laughs> and she's like um well here and she turned around her laptop and she's like this is his x-ray and she proceeded to explain about there's a hole in his diaphragm because his diaphragm didn't completely form and as the rest of his organs and everything form he had a lot of his intestines go up into the right side of his chest and three quarters of his liver went through that hole and it prevented his right lung from forming. Um, so we were kind of, okay, so what's this mean? And she said, he has an 83% mortality rate. We weren't given a survival, we were told the mortality. So that was very shocking, surprising. We weren't sure how to comprehend it. And she took us over to him and he had a tube going in his mouth and down his throat and he had wires coming out of his diaper and IVs and tubes and everything it was just so crazy and she's like I'm sorry you can't hold him right now but you can hold his hand you know um that was rough <laughs> We had five previous babies, if we could hold them all. And for this one, um, being in pain and crying and not being able to comfort him more than holding his hand was pretty wretched. <laughs> so then the doctor came in and he was the surgeon and he was just exceptional. And he, he told us that when he was told this baby was coming in and he met the baby, last night. He said, you know, he goes, I was expecting a very, 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 very sick baby. He said, but what I got, he said, was indeed this very sick baby. But he said he was four days past due. He goes, and those four days gave him so much more strength that enabled him to be such a very, 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 very strong very 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 sick baby he told us that they were planning to do surgery the next day and that um, they were monitoring his um, his blood very closely his blood rate his blood pressure and everything because they didn't want it to reverse he told me which is something that happens a lot and then that creates a stroke or like a heart attack and they could lose him that's why they had the one-on-one -on -one care, so that he would have round-the-clock monitoring, um, which is, you know, comforting to know that everything was being watched. Before he was even 48 hours old, he had his surgery, and we were told that he would have, like, such a small incision and that they would open him and move his organs out of his chest and back down and then it would go from there to see how it all was. 
Um, so the next morning came and we were with him and then they explained to us that um, they were going to have us leave the room when they put him to sleep for surgery because it's just too heart-wrenching seeing an infant be put to sleep for surgery. So we had to leave and uh, it was a good six hours later when they came to get us and let us know that we could go see him again. And the first thing I thought when I saw him was they cut him in half. His incision went from the left side of his belly button all the way halfway to into his side. And it was just unbelievable. I was afraid to touch him because I just had a fear that his incision would open. <laughs> it was horrible. Uh, the nurses and stuff were very comforting. They were very supportive. And their policy in the NICU at our hospital was to have the parents do as much of the care as they can. So we were, they were having us do a temperature and change diapers and stuff. And um, after 12 hours, we were allowed to actually hold him. And that was like a three person job, just lifting him up because of all the monitors and everything on him. He had an epidural that was leaking and um, her nurse was really, really great. She said, the point of the matter is, you know, you can't tell how much it's getting into him and how much isn't. Our biggest concern was the fact that because of the way it was leaking, it was making his entire back wet. And we were afraid, you know, being wet like that and cold, you might get sick. And that's definitely something we didn't want to happen. So we proceeded to um, have it removed where, oh, apparently he was getting some of the meds because he ended up going through drug withdrawal. <laughs> so they had to put him back on the meds and little by little take him off. So that was just kind of crazy too. Um, finally, I think when he was three days old, they were changing out his tube, and it was near feeding time. And the nurse asked if I got to try to nurse him before he came. And I said, no. And she goes, well, why don't you try just to see, to help me build the connection and everything. So I tried. And he didn't really know what to do completely. So it was kind of failed. So I was continuing. And. And uh, in doing that, we went ahead and uh, we tried to give him a bottle, I think two days later, um, because they were having us feed him through a tube. So we're like up above him and it's coming down through over feeding him. And it was just kind of weird because by that point, the tube actually had to go up through his nose and down to his stomach because the little turkey was catching it when it was out of his mouth and pulling it out. <laughs> so that was kind of interesting how we were dealing with that. And I kept telling my husband, I said, I never, I never fathomed that we'd be feeding a child by shoving the food up his nose. And he was just like... You know, I didn't think of it that way because of the tube going up there and everything. And then um, when the nurses are checking to see how digested his food is a couple hours later, they would pull it out into the syringe, look at it and put it back. And I was just kind of like, ew. <laughs> and she was like, what? I was like, well, you're removing stomach contents and putting them back in. And in my world, that's kind of like, you know, if he would have thrown up and we scooped it up and put it back. And she was just like, Ew. <laughs> I just looked at it medically. I didn't think of how somebody would really think of it. And I was like, it's okay. Um, my husband and I are horrible with names. So like we would make up nicknames for our different nurses we had, like um, Bambi, because, you know, she had these really big doe eyes, kind of like Bambi's eyes in the drawing, nothing bad or anything. And then we had the shoe nurse who just wore such interesting, fascinating, colorful shoes. And then we had old school nurse and she was like, the, it's probably negative, but she was the oldest out of all of them. But some of her methods were like, you know, it wasn't the up and current way of doing things. So she was doing traditional things. So 
you know, and then we had hyper, we had a hyper nurse who was always bouncing off the walls full of energy and just kind of all of them together just kept us very positive and encouraged and stuff. And in the middle of our 40 days in the NICU with him, my husband's great uncle passed away and we were so torn because we didn't want to leave our baby, but we didn't want him to say goodbye. So my husband's like divide and conquer, which was kind of like our thing the whole time he was there, where I stayed in Hershey at the Ronald McDonald House in the hospital with him. And my husband came home to be with the other kids and to get them off to their first day of school and say goodbye to his uncle. And it was kind of funny because Hershey, if you don't know, you have Hershey's chocolate. The one nurse came in and she's like, we're not supposed to have food in the NICU, but I think you need a hug. And she gave me a hug and she passed to me a handful of Hershey kisses that were the hug. So meanwhile, um, everything with Eric was going very positive. Um, he was growing. He was keeping his food down. So he was still crying a lot and they were chalking it up to pain. And I said to the old school nurse who kind of bends the rules a little bit with stuff. And I said, I said, it's a half hour before his feeding time. And she's like, yes. Yeah. So I was like, I think he's actually hungry. And she goes, so you want to feed him now? And I said, if, if it's okay, let's try and feed him now. So we ended up discovering that the little turkey, instead of wanting to eat every two hours, we had to feed him every hour and 15 minutes because he was hungry. And he was just going through his feeding so fast. So that was kind of pretty cool. And um, every day we would go in, my husband and I would evaluate all the monitors and tubes and everything that was hooked up on the wall. And we'd be like, hey, this is new. What is this? Or, hey, this one's gone. What did that do again? What does this mean? How is this changed? And just constantly very hands-on and very involved with his care. And then um, they went ahead. He actually, um, we were in the hospital the day that an earthquake hit Pennsylvania. And my husband said, it was just kind of surreal because never had I ever experienced an earthquake before. And my husband's in a rocking chair moving this way. And he says the blinds started going this way. And he's going, whoa. And all I kept thinking was, we're on the seventh floor. <laughs> this is crazy because there was construction going on. So I thought maybe a truck hit the hospital or something because it wasn't a very strong vibration. It was very mild. But um, Eric slept through it. It was amazing. All, a lot of babies in the NICU woke up and were stressed and everything, but he did great. Um, finally, we got moved to another, a smaller room because he was doing, he was doing very well. And in the smaller room, he was in a room with three other babies so um, on the first day in, I was kind of sitting there and taking care of him and monitoring everything. And um, Dr. Christina came in and it was just so cool because what we found out from her was that the day it was her first day as a fellow with the hospital. It was her first day flying with Lifeline and he was her first baby. So she did her rounds with all the other ones. So she came back because she was bringing the students through. And she said, now this, this is my baby. <laughs> and she explained to them all of that. And she's like, and she gave me a hug. And she told me, you don't know this, but I've been coming to see him every day since he's been here. That's and great. She, and we also learned that the Lifeline crew, they do um, daily visits as well checking in on the babies they transport. So even when we weren't there, there was somebody there with him that was familiar with him and knew him. And that was just so reassuring and everything, knowing how much they care and how much they were monitoring the stuff going on with him. So meanwhile- That's well, wonderful. We did, the, um, we did the normal parent thing of reading as much as we could about CDH and what it is and everything that happens and scared ourselves even more. Um, 
I'm going to skip back to when he had his surgery. The surgeon came in and told us, she said, um, I just want to let you know that when we remove his intestines and his liver from his lung space, she said that little teeny tiny lung inflated just like a balloon and just as we all hoped it would. So they were monitoring his lung and she said, it's trying to function like a normal big lung. So she's like, she, she said that she believed that he was gonna make pretty much a full recovery. Oh. And then she said, well, as much of a recovery as you can. <laughs> She said, because she, she said, I didn't want to tell you the wrong thing. She's like, because your son, she's like, he'll never be normal, but he will function normal, as normal as can be, that people aren't going to know that he's been there, he's been through this and everything. Um, so it was kind of cool. And then um, when he got moved to the, the room with the four and everything, old school nurse came for a visit and she's just like, hey, have you tried to nurse him since moving in here? And I was like, no. And she goes, let's give it a try. And I was like, okay. So he was actually um, able to latch on and he was drinking the milk. He swallowed half and half came out. So um, they arranged for him to have a, I believe it's the occupational therapist. Um, coming in to see him. So when he was in in there, he had an occupational therapist, a speech therapist, a physical therapist, a nutritionalist, and there was another specialist who was coming in to see him. And we were just like, wow, he's like 20 days old and he has all these people coming to see him for all these things. And it just kind of blew my mind a little bit. And uh, my husband and I like to joke around a lot and try to look at the positive of everything. And when I was telling him about all the specialists and therapists, he's like, well, he's like, first of all, the occupational therapist, he's like, I want to know what his occupation is. And secondly, how much does he make? Because, you know, this is, we're racking up a really big bill here. And I was just like, oh, you're too much for me. <laughs> but it was about a week later, um, he was able to be moved into the pediatric ward and he was in a room all by himself and he was all the way at the end of the hall from the nurse's station and I was like pretty pretty nervous about that because how can you hear my baby when he's so far away and what if he needs something or what if what if what if and the one nurse looks at me and she goes in all seriousness she goes do you really think we'd let a, an adorable baby in a room by himself she's like no 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 that's why we have this and she showed me they had a little infant bed up at the nurse's station <laughs> that they used oh. for him so he was always with somebody like 24 7. so it was very it was still a little nerve-wracking and stuff and um, dealing with all of that and being separated from the kids um my husband took turns with the kids, bringing them over to see, meet their brother. And um, my in-laws came to see him and my mom came and um, some friends of ours came. And it was, it was a pretty busy place on the weekends for us. Um, we had a major flood that happened while we were in the hospital. So it's just, but he's, he just turned seven last August. He's in second Wonderful. grade. He's a Cub Scout, and he's doing really well. Um, as a matter of fact, when he was born, the uh, pediatrician that was on call actually did his residency at the Hershey Hospital, and he is a pediatric pulmonary specialist. So we were kind of very blessed, and it was funny because um, we were talking with him at his first appointment with him after we were discharged from Hershey. And he said it was kind of, he said it was a very surreal morning for him because he came to the hospital um, two hours before his shift was to start, which is something he said he didn't normally do. He went down and he got his coffee and he said he just had this feeling he needed to come up to the maternity ward. He didn't know why, but he needed to be there. So as he's walking out to get on the elevator, he's like, I threw my coffee away. He goes, I never throw coffee away, no matter how bad it is, but I threw it away. And he said, right as the elevator chimed, 
to say he was on the floor. His pager went off and that he had a 911. And he said he doesn't know what drove him, but he didn't even look to see where he was going. And he just went and came straight into our room where we were. He said he, he, said he seriously believes that he was driven to go there by something because he had actually been exposed in his residency to babies that were born with CDH. And even though he wasn't actually permitted to say what it was directly to diagnose it, um, he said he just knew. So he just sprung into action in getting the um, his airflow going and to get him set up on a respirator so that because he said he just knew that's what he needed to do for him. So it was very, that day was very surreal. And wow. to have him as the pediatrician was just out awesome. And that's uh, great. Have his guidance and stuff with him. Um, he's he's kind of given us kudos. Like he told me he didn't want to see him going into daycare before he was a year old because he wanted to prevent him with having five older siblings. And actually, it wasn't just the five siblings in the house. We were actually caring for two of my nieces. So we had seven children already in this house that would be coming and going from school, basically. <laughs> wow. And, and our pediatrician said, he's going to be exposed to more than enough germs. Don't take him anywhere. <laughs> so that's, well, that's I, what we did. <laughs> I'm so happy to hear that Eric's doing so well. And um, yeah. you, you definitely had your hands full juggling all those kids and, and a CDH baby at the same time. But sounds like your hospital experience was really good and that um, it's always wonderful to hear that and to hear that, that the little guy is doing so great. And um, I really appreciate you sharing your story with us, Chris. Thank you. I felt like I was there with you. You're really, you're really a good storyteller. Thank you. <laughs> sure. We um we actually try to make a trip to Lifeline every year for his birthday, especially since um the doctor in the hospital told us if it would have been for the Isolette and the Lifeline staff, he would not have survived. So wow. um, major kudos to them. So as I said, we go back every year for his birthday and. And the crew loves it. So, like, if you have a child ever transported, it's really great if you can touch base because once they leave their care, unless they're able to follow up through the hospital, but once they leave the hospital, they never know what happens to the to the lives they transport. That's very true. That's very very true. We um, we would follow up with my son's uh, team as well, and they would visit us anytime we were admitted, which was great. Um, very grateful to them. And I well, also found out, sorry, our pilot no, go ahead. had a niece, I believe, that was born with CDH. Wow. So it's a small he, world. It really, really is. So it was just kind of cool to be able to be there for them when they went through it, as much as her uncle was wow. there for us. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing your story and sharing your family with us. We really appreciate it. And, and I hope to, to meet you all someday. Um, maybe see you at the conference in Nashville would be great. All the kids would have a lot of fun. Um, but uh, thank you. And mm -hmm. we'll talk later, okay? Sounds right. good. Thank Thanks, you. Chris. Mm -hmm. Bye-bye.